Thank you, Representative Bruce. Again, I am D. Dawkins Hager, the Chair of the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus, and I'm going to begin with some invocation now that we have called the meeting to order. Let us pray. Dear gracious and eternal God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing everyone to assemble in this place. We ask that for your guidance and your wisdom as we go throughout this hearing. We ask that all the people of Georgia have a voice and a seat at the table, God. We honor and acknowledge you and know that this Georgia uh, General Assembly at the Capitol is the people's house. And so now we ask that you would just cover all of your people so all of your people, those who are in need, the least, the last, and the lost, will have someone to be a voice for them and advocate in this place. We ask it all in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So again, um, Senator Ford is not here, so I kind of went over the uh, purpose of the hearing somewhat. But what we want to do is to have um, relevant and um, policy recommendations to take back for the General Assembly when we begin in January. When I don't know if any of you all were present at the first couple of hearings at the other, um, the commission that the governor put together, but we want to make sure that we reach out to our community and you have actual um, things that we can put down to take back. It's very important that we are very inclusive. As you know, the first go round. Some of the um, chronic diseases were left off the off of the table as it related to being able to use the cannabis oil. Uh, one of those things that was initially left off put back um, was sickle cell, and so we had one of our legislators, uh, Representative Gloria Frazier, along with the Black Caucus, who worked very hard to make sure that sickle cell was put back on um, the table and is included. However, we have other diseases such as lupus that are still left off, and we know that. African Americans and Hispanic uh, suffered disproportionately to lupus as other uh, minority groups. And so we want to make sure that uh, microfalgia and a lot of other things are put back on the table. There are so many um, chronic diseases that we need present. And we also need to make sure that we have a place and a voice where we can make sure that cannabis is accessible here in the state of Georgia so that people will not have to travel outside of this state to receive something that we pass as being legal to have in this state. And so hopefully from being here today and gathering with all of you all, we will be able to put together our own um, commission report that we will be able to get to the governor that will accompany it and so that we can get some things done in Georgia. With that being said, the first speaker this morning is going to be... Um, well, I'm going to wait a second, because we have some legislators and stuff. As they come in, they can come in and introduce themselves, and then we can go ahead and get started. Um, and so, Representative Marie, you sit here. Representative Mitch, you come to the other side of him. Good morning. Good morning. And what we're doing is basically introducing ourselves. I just gave an overview, and then we're going to begin with the um, test. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, State Representative Pedro Marin, uh, representing House District 96 uh, in Winnet County, uh, cities of uh, part of the cities of Norcross and Duluth. And truly a pleasure uh, being here and to discuss a, a very, very important matter. So glad to be here. Thank you. Billy Mitchell, I represent the uh, 88th Legislative District, which is uh, that's primarily DeKalb County, Stone Mountain, to be exact. Uh, I, I'm not a member of this commission, Madam Chair. Uh, like probably most of the members here, assembled here, I've come to get some uh, education myself. Being on the health committee, uh, this is going to be a, a long and enduring uh, deliberation, as there needs to be, uh, as in, in my view, some improvements as the law has been presented thus far. We're glad to be here, and uh, but I added you to the committee. Did you? I did yesterday when you told me you were coming. I went ahead and took that uh, prerogative and made you a part of the committee. Okay. All right. That being said, we're going to go ahead and begin with our testimonies. And the first person we have coming, her name is. You all have that Her name is Sharon Robert Robert, and she is from Peachtree Normal. She is the executive director. Okay, and you would have a seat, yes. Where, where, she's going? I don't know, I thought you were going to Oh, here or here? You, wait, where, you want to stay there? Okay. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. I'm honored to be here today. Thank you for inviting me to testify on what I believe, quite frankly, to be one of the very most important issues facing our state and the citizens in Georgia. My name is Sharon Raybert. I am the executive director of Peachtree Normal Foundation. We are an educational nonprofit working to educate Georgians on the benefits of marijuana as well as the harms of the 80-year prohibition of the marijuana plant. Peachtree Normal began working in Georgia in March of 2012. Normal is an acronym for the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Normal was founded in 1970 and has over 159 chapters worldwide. Four of those active chapters are here right in the state of Georgia. And we have three more in the process of organizing their first meeting. Our membership grows daily. I'm a native of Atlanta. I moved to Dahlonega in 1994 to raise a family and start a business. I was asked here today to talk about the importance of diversity in our struggle to reform marijuana laws in Georgia. When my work in drug policy began some 10 years ago, it was immediately apparent to me when attending conferences, rallies, and educational symposiums that those working for reform and those making those policy decisions were comprised of an inordinate amount of Caucasian males. We have made it our mission to encourage diversity and bring everyone to the table as we move the discussion forward in Georgia. We are all affected and we should all take part in the solutions that we seek. Marijuana prohibition is a hungry monster and it's after all of us, but it seems to have a special focus on people of color. During our research and work in drug policy reform, we have noticed an inordinate and suspiciously large amount of people of color being imprisoned under supposed prohibition crimes. It seems ironic considering that most of the marijuana consumed is actually consumed by Caucasians. It is not to say we want Caucasians or people of color to be arrested in equal numbers. That would be missing the point. What we want are reform marijuana laws where adults who consume marijuana are treated as liberated citizens who can make their own decisions of their, uh, for their own bodies and for their own health. All we're simply asking for is the choice. It is more to, there's more to acknowledge. A majority of the citizens being arrested and incarcerated are patients. Why? Patients are more likely to be in possession they're most likely, they're more likely to be transporting it more frequently, and they are more likely to have larger amounts or concentrated forms that can also lead to felony charges. We must acknowledge that many legal patients from other states travel to and through our state, and our laws put them in jeopardy of arrest as well. We are working to provide legal aid through our normal legal counsel to these unfortunate visitors as well as to the patients that live in our beautiful state. Georgia arrests 30,000 people every year for marijuana. In 2011, 93% of those people arrested for simple possession in Atlanta, 93%, let me say that again, were African Americans. If, it doesn't, if that doesn't highlight the need for inclusion and diversity within our movement and within the policies that are being drawn up and passed, I don't know what will. At the last marijuana committee hearing, medical marijuana committee hearing, we heard from Sullivan Cheney, a veteran living in Fannin County, Georgia, that went to jail for growing marijuana plants for his wife who has MS. David West, a normal criminal defense attorney in Mar Marietta, along with Fannin County District Attorney Allison Sosby, worked to find justice in this case, and the charges were dismissed. This shows that a change is taking place in Georgia and sensible reforms can be achieved. In reality, arrest continues in state continue in states that have legal medical dispensary models. Families have enough to deal with when a family member is ill and sick. They most certainly do not need to deal with the criminal justice system or the Department of Family and Children's Services. They most certainly need not be in a jail cell. In closing, we live in one of the most diverse cities in the world. 
We are an international city, and I am extremely proud that Georgia is leading the way in the Bible Belt on medical marijuana and criminal justice reform. We must move fast, but with careful consideration of all. We are a compassionate, loving state, and we will succeed. Now is the time for all good people from all walks of life and all ethnic backgrounds, both political parties, to take a seat at the table and find sensible solutions to the failed policy that we call marijuana prohibition. Patients are suffering, children are being taken from families, and people are being criminalized over a plant that can help so many and can heal our communities. I would like to thank the Legislative Black Caucus and Latino Caucus for your willingness to educate yourself and your constituents through these hearings. Thank you for the work you did last year to include sickle cell and for your vote to pass HB1. I would encourage you to co-sponsor any and all already introduced bills such as SB7 and SR6 and to introduce more. There's lots of work to be done, but we can do it all together. I would also like to be remiss if I didn't thank Alan Peake and Governor Deal and the members of the Medical Marijuana Committee for the work that they are doing for patients across Georgia. We can do more. I know that the table seems small, but there are a few more leaves in the hutch, and more chairs will be added. There is much work to be done, and to quote Representative Peake, Georgia cannot move fast enough. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions or need more information, studies, statistics, stories, science, or testimony, we are here to assist you in any way and are willing to get whoever you need to speak to here. I am Sharon Raybert, a mother, a wife, a voter, a chronic pain sufferer, a drug policy advocate, and I am not a criminal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Raybert. That was an excellent presentation. We have two questions now. We have one from Representative Roger Bruce and then Representative Billy Mitchell. I'm so sorry. No problem. Thank you for uh, coming and thank you for your testimony. I, I just have a simple question. Yes, sir. You know, I've sat in on a, a number of these hearings, and what, what I keep, what I'm picking from it is that we're combining two issues. Mm -hmm that need to be looked at, in my opinion, separately. I agree. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of them is the, the medical value of marijuana, and the second is the criminal implications of marijuana. Correct. Two totally different things, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think we lose something in the presentation and in the argument where we try to combine them. I don't think that people should be in jail for for marijuana. I don't think that children should be separated from their families. I don't, any, all of that stuff, I, I, I'm on the same page. Yes. What I'm not totally clear on is the medical value. And, and when I say that, I know that there are some studies that show that certain things are, you know, helped. You know, not cured, but helped in terms of pain management and some other things. But, I'm looking for studies, I'm looking for facts that show that expanding the use of marijuana is medically sound. And, and the reason I'm asking the question is because, you know, in speaking with doctors, you know, medical professionals, they are, there's no study that really supports, you know, from the medical community that really supports the medical value. Clearly the pain management you know, is, is there, but the rest of it is not. Do you have information to the contrary? We sure do, and, and there are over 20,000 studies that have been done. The majority of them have been done in Israel and have been being uh, um, worked on for over 20 years. And I will be glad to send you specifics on certain illnesses or uh, general peer-reviewed studies to look at if you if you're interested. And to, to come to, to the whole thing about the difference is, is the problem is, and I understand what you're saying about keeping them separate, and I believe they are, but the, the overall picture to me is prohibition. Because prohibition is hurting not only um, 
is mainly hurting patients in Georgia, and the arrests are important um, to that because our sick and, and dying are, are going to jail or they're sending out their family members to procure their medicine, and those family members are getting caught with it, and they're, their caregivers go to jail. So I agree. Many members of both parties in Congress have confused this, uh, you know, the whole thing, um, have confused a public health issue, medical marijuana, with the politics of the war on drugs. It's very hard, even though we have to, pull them apart. It's difficult to when both patients and people that may use adult consumption, um, maybe the same people or different people, but we do. Um, we, we confuse that issue, and I agree with you. In doing so, though, we have denied an effective medicine to a seriously ill people. Mrs. Robert, is, yes, is, is, there, is there a state law anywhere in our nation where normal uh, appreciates that law? Uh, are there some states that have enacted laws that normal thinks are great legislation that other states may model? There are, there are some. I will be honest and tell you that there is nothing that's perfect. As you well know, every law that is passed, almost, has a little tweaking to do here and there. Um, in Colorado, they're still tweaking, six years later, their medical laws. And I believe we just need to come up with what we feel like is best for our community, because we are different than Colorado and all the others. Uh, but I think we can pick a model. Um, I know that SB7 that Senator Kirk Thompson has put in, which is a broader bill, uh, with with more um, dispensary model um, is 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 picked uh, is is based on the one in Arizona, another red state. I think we're going to have to look towards red states that have already done this. We're not going to be able to take a full leap into a, a California model of medical marijuana. Um, but we must remember that Prop 215 in California was passed in 1996 and they are still tweaking it, and it is still not perfect. There are still patients being arrested, and there are still patients suffering. So it's gonna be a long process, and I'm so thankful that y'all are here to do the work. Thank you so much. One more question. So do you yes, have a list of the states other than Colorado and California that we can just look at the legislation, maybe just to see which states are legal? Yes, You said you have 150, is that correct, 159 chapters? Yes, ma'am. In the country, and four in Georgia? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that would be so helpful for us if you would just show us which states other than Colorado and California, because I know Washington has one, and so does um, Washington, D.C. now. Yes. And Maryland. And Michigan. Okay, I didn't know Michigan. So yeah. that would be helpful there, if you yeah. just Absolutely. give us that so we can use that as a reference. And one statistic, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you say 83% of the arrests are African American? What in Atlanta, in 93 93% of the arrests for marijuana, marijuana, simple possession, not felony possession, simple possession, 93%. That can be anywhere from a seed to an ounce is considered a misdemeanor, simple possession. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Can I ask when, when when you send the list of states, yes. maybe maybe uh, uh, some 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 pointers of what each law in each state does? Uh -huh. I know there's a discrepancy of, of laws right. between the states. So I like to see also within Absolutely. the states, you know, maybe two three bullet points of what they do. That would be helpful. Absolutely, yeah. we Thank have you. that information. I'll be glad to send that over. Thank you so much. Are you going to be here for the duration? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. River. Thank we you. appreciate your testimony. Thank you so much. If you could do this, Representative <laughs> Beasley and Representative Randall, would you all introduce yourself, say where you're from, and then we'll call the next person. You're 22. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and please excuse my being late. The little Uber man got a little mixed up. Um, uh, I am uh, Representative Mickey Randall, and I uh, hail from Macon Bibb County. It's in the central part of Georgia. And uh, I am the ranking member on the health committee here, in, Democratic ranking member on the health committee here in, in the House, and uh, this is my 17th year of service. I represent the BCT, and I represent South Georgia County. 
but you know my heart is with this. Mr. Jim, I had a husband who died of sickle cell. I'm going to bury a young lady today who died of leukemia, and her father now has been diagnosed. So um, with no cures in sight, we got to press on. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Beasley. The next person that we're going to have to testify will be <coughs> I think he has to go to work today. Is it Kenny Williams? Are you? Kenny Williams, you, your mother has MS and you would like to speak about the patient review board qualifications. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. consulting firm and we've been working closely with the Morehouse School of Medicine for over four years now and uh, half half of all of the uh, biotechnology companies that receive funding in Georgia this year uh, those applications were submitted by my company um, now I was introduced to Mr. Richard Brumfield um, by Dr. James Lillard, the Associate Dean of Research and the head of the Technology Transfer Office at Moore School of Medicine in 2014 so that I could help him uh, submit an application to the National Institute of Health. Um, now, his company, Full Spectrum Omega, developed a strain of cannabis that does not fall under the Schedule One guidelines um, FSO has submitted one application already to the National Institute of Health with uh, Dr. Roger Simon as principal investigator uh, and has secured my services for two additional applications upon finding the best principal investigators for the proposals. Um, in May of 2014 last year, Mr. Brumfeld proposed that FSO partner with Morehouse School of Medicine, in order to distribute his medical cannabis product to first in the state of Georgia and then throughout the U.S. The plan was to, to distribute the medicine using the power of the patient qualification review, review board. Excuse me. Uh, the Georgia Composite Medical Board governs the patient qualification review board and was officially recruiting members for it. And from my understanding, they are still technically recruiting members for this, uh, for, for, for the board. Now, just in Georgia, there are approximately 1.3 million cancer patients that will benefit from cannabis, um, as well as other diseases that will benefit. Um, the estimated, I'm giving you this background to, to, to lead up to something critical. Um, so if you bear with me. But the estimated revenues to the Moore School of Medicine for sales of the cannabis related in Georgia was projected to exceed $300 million. That number is based off of the 1 million plus possible patients in Georgia. And MSM would realize 10% of the sales made at $300 per bottle because uh, Mr. Brumfield had an agreement with MSM uh, to pursue this. Now, upon reviewing Mr. Brumfeld's proposal, Dr. Lillard, uh, let's see, excuse me, Dr. Lillard, the, the head of the Technology Transfer Office at Moore School of Medicine, he asked me to assist him with compiling a PowerPoint and figuring out if the, the uh, George Composite Medical Board was indeed recruiting members for the Patient Qualification Review Board. So upon my findings, Dr. Little was going to bring this opportunity to the Morehouse leadership and recommend that they submit the necessary doctors to seek this board. Now as of today, 
The patient qualification review board is still recruiting members. In 2004, I emailed with Sean Hughes, the, ex the executive director of the Georgia Composite Medical Board, inquiring about the proper way to submit the doctors uh, for the purpose of seating the board. And her response was troubling to me because she told me that the board had been dismantled. Now, at that moment in time, I, I, I don't understand why I was misled by Director Hughes because when she said the board had been dismantled, that made Dr. Lillard, um, he no longer wanted to pursue the, the Patient Qualification Review Board with Full Spectrum Omega because of what she said. And, you know, the MSM partnership with Full Spectrum Omega could have been treating millions of patients by now if not for um, what the Sean Hughes said. Let me, let me do this. I'm going to stop you for a second. Because Mr. Bromfield is here, and it seems like you are referring a lot to his research. Maybe we should hear from him, and then that will undergird what you're saying, because I'm a little lost. Not, not that your presentation is not clear, but I need to know what it is Mr. Brumfield has done so we can understand what you are following up with, and then it'll make the picture clear for all of us. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, okay. Because I'm a little the weak. Point I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make is that the Patient Qualification Review Board okay. had the power to start a program, or excuse me, has the power to initiate a program where they can treat any type of patient that they want to treat. So for example, they can say, they can say okay, we're going to start this program and we're going to treat sickle cell, MS. They can determine what they're going to treat. And the Moha School of Medicine was willing to submit the physicians that could have made this happen a year ago. But if not, for LaShawn Hughes's lie, basically, because I have it in the email and I can I can get it to whoever I need to send it to. She told me that the board had been dismantled. And that totally shut Morehouse down because they weren't willing to pursue something that may not be real. But it was real. And you know, we we can all go to the website and see that they're still recruiting members. And I, I, I don't understand why that we, we were misled, but we were. And it's a shame because it's a shame because my mother could have been in that program. And I know that that treatment would help her. So, yeah. so I, I've been dealing with that for a whole year now. And that's why I'm here today. Because, you know, I didn't just jump into this. You know, Mr. Brumfeld had something viable. Like, the Mohawk School of Medicine said, this man has something I want to look into. Help me. Help me do this. And when we went down the road, LaShawn Hughes shut the door on us. And we could have had we could have had the backing of the Moha School of Medicine. We wouldn't even be here right now if LaShawn Hughes had allowed the Moha School of Medicine to seat that board. And I have proof. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for that. Are you going to be here just to hear Mr. Barfield's testimony? Or do you have to get to the bill? Won't you, Mr. Bibor, situation? I got to go. Okay. But I'm available. I mean, I, I, I'll come back. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, thank you so much. Is your mother, your mother is still currently suffering with MS. How is she get receiving treatment? Well, they told me that their pharmacy, she's in a facility, and they told me that their pharmacy would not give her the formula because they don't have any uh, guidelines mm -hmm. in place. And so I'm stuck in between the rock and the hard place. Um, okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for that. 
um, Mr. Barfield, you come on. I need you to come and, and talk to us a little while. Now, we, now we're talking now. We don't want you to talk an hour. We need you to talk about like 10 minutes. We're about to get excited. Look at you. You already get excited. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, Chairwoman, and all of the guests of the Georgia Convention of Legislation by Carcass, I'm honored to be here today and to speak on the matter of uh, minority participation in the, in the medical cannabis community. Um, you, in your new conference, you stated that the minority participation was not visible here in Georgia. And not only in Georgia, but in all over the United States where they have enacted cannabis, medical, or recreation, blacks have been denied, and Latinos have been denied at the table. I have been a, I am an FDA clinically investigated with, and a Department of Defense contractor who cannot get no help from university or researchers to bring out my product to be analyzed so that it could be put into the service of the United States military. I have a contract to that effect, too. Mr. Barker, do you give us your that. background for a second? You are a disabled <coughs> veteran, is that correct? All right. So we can... I'm a serving disabled veteran minority business concern. I am also a DOD contract with a commercial and government entity number, which allows me to accept any type of award contract from the federal government. And I'm also the only person in the system award manager, SAM.gov, which is stated as a phytocannabinoid research, phytocannabinoid life science, not biotech. Um, I work, I got all thrown out because I'm unexpected to step up right now. Okay, <laughs> so excuse me. I have been researching cannabis since 2007 and put in a United States patent in 2008, a preventing patent. At the time I, I put in a preventing patent in 2008, I couldn't get no help here in the United States, so I went to Vancouver, Canada, and started working with Help Canada. Help Canada worked with me and helped me get a certificate of analysis so I could see what their product was. Once I had a certificate of analysis and, and the efficacy of my product, I was offered a natural product number by Health Canada so they could put my product in their university health care. I decided not to take the, the Canada natural product number, but decided to come back to the United States because I wanted my product to be here in the United States. I'm a service disabled veteran. My first lawsuit to the United States. I came back to the United States and started a business full spectrum Omega Incorporated in 2010 with two of my business partners. Gilmore being a first generation Latino and a Native American Indian named White Deer. We are, we are, I think we're the only fully enclosed minority representative in this, in this industry. Um, I have developed a low THC oil formulation in Topka application to improve the quality of life for those suffering a broad range of health conditions and in many cases provide relief and healing for those suffering from cancer, varied type, COPD, MS, AL, Crohn's disease, and others. Before the company became full spectrum, it was called Ricky Ball McGillany in Vancouver, BC, where I went there in 2009 uh, to help understand my formula. In May 2010, I was invited to Georgia by um, Right Reverend Gregory Carr Davis to put my form into clinical trial study for patient response, and we submitted to the Georgia Department of Medicine Board along with Dr. Pagan, our patient, Dr. Monitor study, and the results are available. I have I sent it to the Georgia Department Medical Board in 2010 along with the patient response. Uh, <clears throat> in 2012, I traveled to Fort Detrick, United States Army Medical and Maturity Command to demonstrate one of my phytocannabinoid topical to the, to the military, and they gave me a new product idea number, along with a broad age announcement so I could finish the research and have a contract on that, on the topical. In 2012, I also went to uh, Rockville, Maryland, and met with the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, and had one of the ladies there, um, her name, 
Dr. Andrew, Andrea Nicolo, Nicolo Cohen, who became my NIH sponsor and helped me develop my step to become a clinical researcher. Can you do this for us, Mr. Barfield? Can you tell us, because you know, we want to make sure we get everyone in, what your product is. You are the only person that is certified in the United States for cannabis. What is it called? Cannabis. Phytocannabinoid. Phytocannabinoid. And that, and so, so kind of tell us what it is. You have an agreement with Morehouse School well, of Medicine. Is that it? Oh, that's what you created. It's one of them. That's one of the products. This is one of the products. This is a topical that is that the military wants. It's on a broad age announcement. It used to fight third degree burn, staph infection, help skin regeneration. And the other product is the cannabis oil. This little blue bottle, which is totally legal. Thank you very much. The GAC level point zero three is exempt under 21 CFR 13.1308.35. I've been working with the DEA out of Springfield, Missouri, at Springfield, Virginia, for the last two years, and also with the Oakland uh, Division, the DEA office up in Oakland, because I grow cannabis myself, me and my group, and we had to get. Organization for them to let them know what we're doing, that we're doing medical research on it. Okay, Mr. Brown, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, one, uh, you say you wrote yourself. Where where are you doing this? Hey, Fall, hey, Fall California. California. Okay, and um, of that breed of of of, of cannabis plants, how you say you have created two different. Um, therapy, drug therapy. You know, I, I don't get many, I have many uh, products, but about I'm, how many? Thirty-five. Thirty-five, and it's one species. But only, only, only bringing out three of them because too many of them is just don't look right. I'm, so you I'm, have three that are being distributed. I have three products that I'm really concentrated on. Uh, it's called NEPD fourteen. It stands for non euphoric phytocannabinoid illicit. 14 is a plant number and also having an extra strength. So these are all in part 0.3% THC or less and uh, <clears throat> totally non euphoric, safe for elders and, pedi and pediatric care. And uh, we have, I have my uh, CEO, Dr. Gary Bedore, who is going to put out a white paper. Uh, Maybe tomorrow, I'm not sure. Okay. All right, so what we need to know, basically, quickly, what we needed to know was uh, how many drugs you developed from the species of marijuana that you're growing and where it was grown. And then the other thing we need to know is tell me how your ability to get this, uh, the three drugs that you concentrated on, how, how can we help you is the question. Oh, okay. Well, I just finished doing, going through grad certification, generally mm -hmm. regarded as safe with an FDA uh, compliant country, company, which showed that I legally authorized to cultivate, process, and distribute my formulation. And also, uh, the last part of the FDA stuff I did do is the efficacy. And with Georgia opening up the door to allow patient and doctor monitoring, I get the efficacy I need so that their product could be turned into the FDA as a self-determined grass notification and also have a drug control number for my product already so it can be billable at medical food once it had been shown the efficacy. And this this main when I came to Georgia, I'm trying to get efficacy. Once I prove it, I have an eight-week program, an eight-week clinical study, and a 90-day study. And in no time period, we have seen total wellness, improvement in life, and in some cases, completely no sign of disease. And we will be getting a white paper out tomorrow. I don't know exactly what day it will be published, but I'd be glad to just send a copy to all of y'all so you can see the results. And it was 31 patients. Out of 31 patients, only three of them died, and they broke the protocol. Six of them are still going through, and the rest of them are disease-free. Okay, and so tell us about last question. Tell us the tell us about your roadblock in, in achieving this. Effort. My roadblock is getting university and and um, doctor to work with me. 
What universities have you approached? I went to um, Morehouse School of Medicine, Oklahoma. Morehouse School of Medicine put in a, a scientific technology research grant, and, and uh, we got reviewed, but we did not go enough to to get the grant for three hundred twenty-five thousand. So we're going to resubmit on December fifth. Okay. Then we have Oklahoma University. No, no, no. I'm talking about Georgia. We can't help you, in Oklahoma. Tell, tell me what Georgia, what Georgia. Uh, well, it's Dr. Lenoir and, and Morehouse School of Medicine. So it's just Morehouse School of Medicine that you've approached for, for help? Yeah, they, okay. we already working together. We have a, I already put my maturity in their laboratory. I already have a maturity transfer agreement signed by them. Okay. Uh, we have a collaboration agreement and an equity share agreement all in place. The uh, only thing that happened was when Sean Hughes told Dr. Lenoir that they were not going to set that they did come out of the patient qualification review board, that kind of like tore everything up because that was on October 13, 2014. Okay, now let me ask you this. So that review board could have given you, that That could have cleared your role, right? Well, like, we would be able okay, to have a meeting today if, if, if we wouldn't have told that the patient qualification review board had to dismount. Okay, gotcha. In in, I, think, I think we got our answers from you. Did you see Yeah, I, I just want to hear Clarification, I want to make sure I understand because I didn't have a chance to look at your background. Do you have any medical background? I know, sir. I'm a, um, my previous position was senior material analyst with Norfolk Brown with Bay Technology. I'm a, I'm a procurement, I'm a procurement program officer, so I have a lot of, um, I have no medical background. That's why I have other people in medical coming in with me. Uh, to do the research because I'm not a researcher. Okay, I, I just want to make sure I understood. The, the other pe the other question I have is that the studies that you have done, do those studies include how whatever the products are that you come up with, how they interact with other drugs and other medications? Yes, sir. With, I have adverse, we have, we develop adverse warning for certain, certain things we're looking at and also it works real well with almost any type of medication you take because my form is a natural derivative, anything or inorganic that is just setting your body, they're gonna push it out. So we had a lot of good results with people taking my formulation with chemo, they had no hair loss, they didn't lose their weight, they had, they had an appetite and they never had to go on no serious pain medication. Okay. All right. Because we'd like I'd like to see that too, because that would help us as we go I'm forward. Sorry. I said, I'd like to see whatever you can make available to us that talks about the interactions, because that seems to be the biggest, well, one of the biggest arguments that we get from the medical community is that they don't want to prescribe these other products like yours because they're, they don't, they're not sure how they will interact with other medications. And if this doesn't go through the normal process of approval for drugs, then there's, there's no data that, that, that they feel comfortable with. So they, they're concerned about lawsuits and all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. If they prescribe something and they don't know how it interacts with other medications. Well, we have been, we've been chart monitoring all of our patients. We have a two-year chart monitoring program that we just finished up. And we learned a lot of stuff about uh, different medication. And uh, in fact, most of the medication Prescription drug, people right. got off of it. Yeah, I don't worry about that. So, so, can you do this one more time for me? You hold up your product to get it in. Representative Beasley T has a question. These are the two products you're trying to get in Georgia. What did you have again? Show us your product. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm 51% there with 10 to 9 ringing in the ear. I'm sorry. You talk fast, you're really. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Let me do this. Show us your products again. What, mine? Product. What about it? Show your products. Is it. It's our NEP 14. What about it? Show us both again. So, oh, it's totally. Oh, no, no, don't no, open it. Just show us the other one, too. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to see. That, gonna that's the oil. That's yes, ma'am. And it's, that is called what, ma'am? This is one centimeter per 100 pounds, and you take it three times a day, subliminal underneath the tar. And also, you can take it in your nostril, in your nostril. I had throat cancer twice. I got rid of it four times, three weeks, taking it formula by taking it through my nostril. I suffered from a massive stroke in 2009, 
and I took the formula. At 18 hours later, I walked out to the VA hospital completely well. And then the other one, yeah. What's the other bottle? Oh, oh. oh sorry. Oh, oh, and that's a topical. It goes on. It goes on. It hurts. It will stop any pain anywhere on your body. It don't feel like it. We're going to talk after this. I need some of that. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to thank you for coming. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I appreciate you, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, so, much. Thank you so much. And thank you for being a survivor. We thank you for being a two time, three time survivor cancer. And you, you're well, still doing everything that you're doing. Thank you. I actually just come in for us to save my ex wife life, my first ex wife life. She had a lot of fun. Uh, I'm counseling on non primary in a sinus area. And if she was born and died in October 2011, she's still alive today, counseling free. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, the next person that we're going to hear from is, is Dr. Uma Donna Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and all of you folks to be here, and all of you folks behind me, too. I thank you very much. I'm Dr. Uma Dhanabalan. I am originally from India. I came to this country in 1970 with my parents and my brother for one main purpose, which was education. This word education is something that I truly believe passionate about and this country is the land of opportunity and truly the land of education. People take it for granted and so much is taken for granted. I'm very fortunate to be a doctor and to be trained in this country. I graduated from high school in 1979 from Livingston, New Jersey. I have over 20 years of medical education, formal education. And it was in 2011, I first learned the word endocannabinoid system. I had never heard this word. I had never been educated about this system, this system of which life would not exist from. The endocannabinoid system is over 600 million years. It is in life, and we would not have life without it. Yet, I never learned about this system in all my years of training. I came to know about this because of my mother, and I watched a TV program where they used cannabis in Israel for lung cancer, COPD, and asthma. In all my life, I had told patients not to smoke. My first training is in family medicine from Charleston, South Carolina. My second life from 1998 to 2003 was at Harvard in Boston, Massachusetts. I did my MPH. I did my second life in occupational environmental medicine. I was very much in depth with lead and did my fellowship. I'm also a medical review officer, which means I'm familiar with drug testing and many people that have lost their lives because of drug testing, positive for a drug that's killed nobody. Nobody has ever died from this medicine. And we are speaking about a medicine that should be first line, not last line for people. It's not for everybody but it should be available for everybody. My mother died of IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Fancy term for we don't know what caused your lung disease. My mother never smoked a cigarette, never touched red meat, 
She exercised, she did all the right things. I've seen over 4,000 patients that I've certified for, for cannabis. I don't write a prescription for this medicine because it's in Schedule 1. It's been there since 1970. It was placed there along with heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. And again, cannabis has killed nobody. I don't write a prescription for it because I can only write a recommendation for this medicine. I am proud to say I don't have a prescription pad in my office. I don't write for narcotics or opioids. Two years ago, I made a statement. Cannabis is not an entrance drug. It is an exit drug from pharmaceuticals and narcotics. And I stand by that. I have a practice in Massachusetts. I started this practice August 20th, 2014. And I don't have patients that are dying from what I'm writing. I've been able to get patients off their medications. You talked about sickle cell. We talked about different illnesses. I don't want a list. I'm trained. Let me make the decision for my patients. We don't need lists. We don't need different guidelines. We have 23 states that have medical marijuana. If I cross my line from one state to another, if patients are not allowed to take their medicines and be thrown in jail for something that's healing them, mental illness is huge. It crosses no boundaries. Everybody faces it. And people don't seek help for it. I truly believe most, if not all, patients using cannabis have been self-medicating. Self-medicating for something that they can't reach out to and get a prescription for. That, um, is it Bailin? Please call me Dr. Uma. Everybody Dr. calls Uma. me Uma. Okay, Dr. Uma. Thank you. Uh, and I, I appreciate your being here and your passion. Uh, I too am an MPH, so I am uh, in a real peculiar situation here because I'm a legislator on this hand and I'm an MPH. And so I understand how important this issue is. But what I need from you, what we need from you is we have to impress upon our colleagues to embrace whatever we bring forth. So if you can help me make that argument, um, that's really what we're here for. I thank you for saying that. There's three words I like to use always. Educate, embrace, and empower. That's what we do. I am still trying to educate my colleagues. When I use the word cannabis, you know, when I first started doing this, I said, I'm a family doc, I'm committed. Mm -hmm. Cannabis medicine. Now I say, I am a cannabis medicine doctor. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm proud to say that. Mm -hmm. And there is so much literature. I'm hoping by the end of this year, my data from my own patients will be published to show that they are getting off their narcotics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. They are getting off their narcotics. And we have an opioid epidemic. 258 million prescriptions were written by doctors, which meant every adult in the United States had one month supply of opioids. Not acceptable. All right, let me pose it this way. Okay, so we're at a point now, we've passed something that's not what we wanted. It wasn't what the author initially uh, introduced. It's been scaled down tremendously. Uh, the initial uh, legislation went from cultivation by way of our flagship state institutions, uh, two of which that I can think of, one down below me, Fort Valley State, that would have been a perfect place to uh, do the research and cultivation. And, and even UGA could have been, both state institutions. So when we, when, when the author uh, came to us about, about this bill, this bill was comprehensive. 
this bill went from cultivation to uh, distribution. The governor was not in favor of that wide, expansive bill. So you do know we passed what we could. Okay, let's get that clear. We passed what we could. Okay, now this is a stepping we, step. Exactly, and that's what that's where we are now. We want to build on what we have, and we need you all to help us with the argument as we build on what we have. Now, we were able to include some of the chronic illnesses that we knew for a fact uh, would give some patients that had those chronic illnesses some relief. So now, our, where we are now is we need you all to help us build the next phase. Where do we go from here? I want to be able to practice what I've learned. I mean, I have my degrees. I've got all these freaking initials. It doesn't mean anything to anybody if I can't take care of my patients. I, I don't want a list from a politician who is not a doctor telling me how to practice medicine. I, I understand that, but you know who make the rules. So, so please, no, this uh, is what I want. I want two things. Here you go. I want doctors and healthcare providers that write the recommendations to be trained properly Okay, to be certified and have the education. I want to see more caregivers, not just dispensaries, and I want to see testing. I want to see laboratory testing, mandated laboratory testing. Rule number one is do no harm, right? That's what I was told. Absolutely. Do no harm. So I want to see standards. I don't want medical marijuana to become marijuana mills, okay? That's the first thing because. I've done this, and I've been educating myself. And there's people out there making this into a business. Okay, let okay. me ask you this. So, are you? So, you're not in favor of expanding the list of chronic conditions by which? Okay. I so, want to be able to say, let the doctor decide what to treat the patient with, not a list. Okay. Well, well, you know that's how legislation works. That's how it works. It starts with a list, and 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 sometimes that list can be. The expired. patient is not different from state to state. I understand that. I understand. But you got to understand where I'm coming from. That's the reason why I, when, when I start speaking, I, I let you know that I'm an MPH on this side, but I'm a legislator on this side, okay? So help me meet in the middle, regional, reasonably, where ultimately i got to get something passed. All I'm saying is if we made the word chronic pain. Okay. Chronic pain. So we okay. need to, we need to clear up the definition of chronic pain in, in the code. We need some definitions as far as for all. Okay. If I can just say if we can say chronic pain period. Okay. I'm not sure what chronic pain says in our code, but I will look at Chronic see. is anything considered over six months is how I define it with my patients. I mean I'm not throwing cannabis as as I understand that's how you define it, but I've got to see what the code says to see how I can clean that up and make that uh, that net a little wider, because that's what we've got to do. Um, but I don't want all doctors doing this either. I want you to understand, we need training in this, we need education. We, it's like a general surgeon saying, I'm going to be a cardiologist. No. Okay. okay? We now, need training and guidelines. And, and you're right, but that is way down the road from where we are. I'm sorry, I think that should have been first line. You can't have somebody doing something if we don't have guidelines. You know, they, they made this up, but none of the doctors are trained. They don't even know the word endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that means. They have no idea. And if I say cannabis, they laugh at me. It's weed, right? Oh, you're just out there writing weed prescriptions. Mm -hmm. That's how they look at me. I'm a weed doctor. Okay. I agree. We, we probably should have gone on two tracks at the same time. We but need education first across the board in all medical schools. 2% of medical schools are even teaching the word endocannabinoid. Okay. So, you, I want everybody to understand, you know, the day we're born, we're all going to die, okay? What the illness we're going to die from is, 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 is going to vary, right. okay? Okay, so your suggestion to us is that as we go back and build on what we have, your suggestion is that we include some type of training for physicians. Please. All the healthcare providers, so, not just physicians. So all healthcare providers. Your recommendations to this committee is one that we look at the uh, official definition of chronic pain in, in our in our um, code. code, and two that we look at uh, another track to include some type of specially training, specifically specially trained for doctors that are going to do the recommendations, but across the board. 
we need the word endocannabinoid system taught to all healthcare providers across the board, number one. Okay. And you need doctors and healthcare providers that are going to write these recommendations to be certified and trained properly. Okay, we got you. We appreciate you. Thank you. Hi, just very, very quickly, I'm a physician here in Georgia for 15 years. I'm sorry. I'm a physician name? here, Dr. Catherine Amarula, call me Dr. Kathy. I'm a board certified family practice doctor here. There are CME courses for doctors, all right? I am part of the committee that can actually provide that, get a group of doctors together, come in and train doctors here in Georgia. I have patients, I've been here since 2015. So understand, CME are quick crash courses for doctors that are interested. It's available for doctors that are ready to learn. Okay. It's not difficult, it's very easy. Just to her, let you know. Her, her point is that it should not be optional. Exactly. No, no. her point, from what I understand is, let it be freely decided, whoever gets it, by the doctors. Anyone that yeah. needs it, that's what she's saying. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Absolutely. That's what she's right. saying. I'm not saying but, all doctors. Well, doctors that are trained, trained in doing recommendations for cannabis should be able to make the decision. Not, for any patient, period. I understand that, but I also heard you say that they don't stop doc, because it's not being taught, even introduced as a as a, as a, option as, as an option in medical school that they should at least have an introduction to. It. But CME courses, that's what it's for. A new drug comes out, we have to learn about the drugs. And remember, this is a medical food at this level. Okay. We have medical foods. Okay. Versus medication. Gotcha. The medical food is available as a medical food, but as a prescription, there are courses for doctors to learn step by step about the endo endocannabinoid system and also about the side effects and about the benefits, pros and cons. And it's not a very long course. And that's but but that's optional. That's what I'm getting from. Right. I want it. I'm sorry. I want to see every healthcare provider know the word endocannabinoid system. Okay. Period. And. You're right about the continuing medical education, but that's just one part. But you're saying just basic terminology. Please, that's okay. all. I want the word endocannabinoid. And you're saying that, that CME is available. There are patients dying now. No, 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 no. We I'm need to be trained now on okay. how to administer at the level we are right now. All right. So, so, but where we are right now is we can, one, clear up the definition of chronic pain, and two, introduce at least the... Uh, the world. System. Right, okay. You see, I can actually get a medical marijuana card for a patient right now. Okay. Then she said, she asked me, I've done it already, she mm -hmm. asked me, how do I get it? How do I use it? Mm -hmm. So, doing a long course or learning about all the, you know, definitions and implications of marijuana is, you know, we're making it very difficult. It's very simple if we do see me courses which, again, I have a group of people that can do this for doctors here in Georgia. Okay. A very simple CME course that will certify those that are interested. If you're not interested, doctors are not all going to be interested. Okay. For those that are interested in providing it to our patients now that are suffering in Georgia, now. Okay, I understand. I just want to make sure. But so, the doctors are alienating my okay. patients. Like, my patients what? are being thrown out of their practices okay. because they want to use this medicine. But I, I, make it clear, I, I, I understand you, but what I'm trying to get you all to understand is that we have got to put the, we can't put the cart before the horse. And we're, we're here to build on what we've already done, and we need you all to tell us what our next step should be. Now, kind of what you all are talking about is not step phase two, it's probably three or four. Yeah. But we hear you. But we hear you. But in what we do as legislators, it's, it, it's, it's in some Please this educate area, everybody with the word endocannabinoid from college. Right. That's right. We're trying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just add, though, that the colleges is, you know, fine, but we are talking about patients dying now. Face five. Representative Bruce and then Representative Bruce and Okay. Let's let's try to make sure that we understand what what's going on here. Okay. We are trying to come up with some kind of legislation that we can get passed. Okay. And the reality is that while we all may have an opinion, we all may have a thought process on how we are, we are dealing with people who are not even in the room right now, so they're not hearing what you're saying, okay? So we have to come up with something that we can move through a very, very, very complicated system. And one of the questions that I have for you, doctor, because you know the, the fact that you have a medical background 
is good for me because that has been the biggest argument throughout this whole thing is that everybody that's been pushing this has no medical background. So the question I have for you is, is, is kind of twofold. One is, if, what, what argument can we make as to why we're not going through the normal process for approving medication that we have done for all the other medications that are out there? That's one question. And then the second question is, when somebody actually takes the medication that you're talking about, and there's some confusion around that because the medication is not the same state to state, place to place, because we don't know who's growing it, first of all, and then we don't know what they're doing in that growth process. So you might prescribe something based on what you know is in that product, but another doctor in another state could make a, pres a, a prescription and it could be something totally different because we don't know what people are using to grow this stuff. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So those are the two things I'd like you to address. Okay. Uh, first question was uh, it's in Schedule 1 right now, okay, which means we can't write a prescription for it. Doctors have a DEA license. There are five schedules. We write a prescription for things in Schedule 2 through 5. Cannabis is in Schedule 1, along with heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. It needs to be descheduled first. That's the first thing that has to happen, number one. It should not be in the schedule that it is in. Number two, testing is very, very important. And again, do no harm is rule number one. I want to see all the medicine be tested, laboratories across the board. So just like you get a blood test done, right? If your glucose is 100 with a finger stick, it's 100 across the board, right? Standardization. We need standardization. We need labs that are certified that we can have, that we can have the medicine tested across the board. If, if a medicine tests 50 milligrams of THC in Georgia, it should test 50 milligrams in Massachusetts or on any other state. Okay, and that's what I thought you were going to say, which makes what you just said a federal issue mm -hmm. as opposed to a state issue. Exactly. A local issue. And, and as such, you know, we don't have, we don't have jurisdiction, you know, to, 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 to do what you just said uh, across the board. But that's the argument that we're getting against legalizing, you know, for, for moving this thing along in Georgia. Exactly what you just said is the argument that we're getting from opponents as to why we should not be moving forward with this medication, based on what you just said. And um, so I'm a little confused because it sounds like one side of you is saying we need to to do this. We need to make this drug, or this medicine available to your patients as you, as, as you deem appropriate because you are the medical professional and we're not. And I agree with you, we're not. But we still have a responsibility to protect, just like you said, is to protect. And in order to do that, we have to have facts. Fact is and nobody has died from cannabis. Well. Okay, you know, that's, that's, that fact is not going to make this go forward. Because medical you, food. I'm sorry, just, it's a medical please food. Please don't I'm interrupt. Sorry. You have to be recognized. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. It's a medical food, please. Okay. So we're just trying to, in order for us to help, we have to be able to talk factually and medically and scientifically. So that's what we're having a hearing for so that we can hear from people who have knowledge that we don't have so that we can go forward with it. All I'm saying is that I did not have this knowledge from my education. I had gone through all these degrees and never been taught this. So first is education about it. The second is to embrace this as an option for patients. And this medicine has killed nobody. It could be an empowerment to get patients off of other medicines which we know kills and has side effects. The average patient, like I always say, is on a party pack of five. Blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, 
something for reflux, and something for anxiety or depression. That's just to name five. And I'm getting them off of these pills. They have quality of life and hope. That's what this is about. It's about giving hope here. Thank you. Uh, Representative Beasley T. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I understand the piece about education. Uh, what I'm looking at is um, over 50 years of people suffer. Okay. And in medical school, doctors are not taught how to take a blood pressure reading, but they prescribe everything that you just said. So what I, I'm looking for at this committee doing and the rest of the world is coming on board with how it can be used and what the benefits would be. So um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a machinist. But I had to learn this from Emory to be able to sit here on the Georgia General Assembly and say that this is what we need at this particular time. And we have needed it for over 50 years. They're just not, just states are just now coming on board and doing what they think is necessary, what they believe. I mean, and that's how it because you're dealing with people that have no idea what medical field requires, requires for, you know, the education and whatnot. So if I, we could just get the schedules, the way that they should be, so that we can, because they just made a, what's it, the drummer doll, a, a, a schedule something that it wasn't in the last six months. So they, they fluctuate with it. So <coughs> just, if you could just give us something possibly, it, you know, in your experience, what uh, a kindergartner, could explain to somebody. That would really help. Okay, guys, so that's what we're dealing with here. Are we dealing with people that don't have a clue? Okay, perfect. I, I like your question very much. The endocannabinoid system, okay, like I explained in the beginning, was life. There are receptors throughout our body, primarily two. One in the brain, called CB1, and CB2 in the immune system. That's why this medicine works for so many illnesses, okay? These receptors work with three things. Either a phytocannabinoid, which is from a plant, endocannabinoid, which is made in your body, or synthetic. These three things work with these receptors, and that's why it works for so many different ailments. When these receptors are managed by what our own body makes, which is not enough, and we can substitute it with a plant-driven, it's able to do five things. Relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. This is what the endocannabinoid system is meant to do in life. And we are in an imbalance. Our body doesn't produce enough, so we need to give it. If I was diabetic and I needed insulin, you'd say, Dr. Jimmy, you need insulin, right? If I was deficient in vitamin D, you'd say, take vitamin D or get some sunlight. If I was deficient in endocannabinoids, you need to tell me, please supplement with cannabinoids. That's what this plant does. That's as simple as I can explain it. It, it is able to do what life, basic life, relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. This is our basis of homeostasis. We don't have enough of our own endocannabinoids made. We need to replace it with what we get from a plant or synthetics. Synthetics kill. This plant does not. Thank you. Dr. Oman, thank you for your, your testimony. Uh, the next person we're going to have is a pot shop. Um, is that D. Paul? Is D. Paul here? Okay. Hot shot. Not here. Not here. Okay. Coach. Coach. In the uh, in the interest of time, we have uh, approximately twelve uh, people who still want to speak. So yeah, and so and so, please limit your comments to about you know three minutes or so, and then let's see if we can get a little response. But let's try to get some salient points out. Thank you, thank you, Coach. How you guys doing today?
Good. We were talking about um, offer recommendations so you guys want to take into the, the regular committee and helping out with the process that they're going through right now. Um, some of the things that I'm even hearing around today are kind of like, uh, uh, we're kind of like miseducated about a lot of things that are going on. Uh, one in particular, um, uh, Ms. LaShawn Hughes is not going to be able from the private board, is not going to be able to handle most of the people's problems. It's actually Mr. Robinson that's over at the Board of Regents, and he is the one who's directly over the program. So uh, if you guys direct him, I mean, contact him directly, I think you guys will help uh, one of the constituents out right off the grip. Uh, the second part of what we're trying to offer uh, comes from Mark Prosper, and it's uh, basically dealing with research, trial development, and most of the stuff that we were actually talking about today. Good morning. Um, my name is Mark Prosper. I'm with CPR 420, uh, which is an information and health solutions provider firm. Uh, we've been organized since 2001, incorporated in 2014 for the purposes of initializing clinical trials and studies uh, on interventional oil-based treatments and modalities to collect, assess, disseminate empirical data to the general public, to key political and government agencies, and to the medical community. Um, I just want to speak real candidly. Um, a lot of what they're saying uh, rings true to us because this is our day to day. Day to day, we've been trying to push to, to provide clinical data and the information that um, a lot of you guys need and want. Um, again, not just the politicians, but the medical doctors, as she so pointedly stepped up and said, a lot of people just are, are not educated at all as it pertains to what's going on. So. It's, it's been a long struggle of ours to get through the door to be able to provide clinical trials or even just a clinical observation. You know, here in the state of Georgia, we passed HB1. Um, we know that there are many barriers that exist. However, there are over 100 people who have medical cards now who are medicating. However, this data is not being uh, properly collected and assessed. It is definitely not being collected by uh, a third party. Um, we've had this trouble not only at the state level, but at the federal level as well. Um, in dealing with the NIH, ironically, the NIH, or the National Institute of Health, is comprised of about 27 different institutes and centers. Ironically, the center that deals with marijuana is, is the National Institute of Drug Abuse. <laughs> Um, so it, it's kind of geared, the reason why so much data is missing and there's not this informa uh, information available to you guys to make decisions is it, kind of by design. Even here in Georgia, when following uh, the protocol as it's written in HB1 and following up with the State Board of Regents, which is, is the only institute that's allowed to do uh, clinical data, I mean, we've been bounced around from, from the composite board um, to the DEA at the state level to back to, oh, to the Department of Justice, back to a medical review board, back to the State Board of Regents. And from what we've been told, there's only really one firm here that's doing any clinical trials, and it's the same firm that's, uh, uh, that's producing the medicine that's on trial right now, which is GW Pharmaceuticals, which is a UK-based company. Um, you know, we've made attempts to assist. We've made attempts to, to at least take that information and, and pair it or contrast it against the national information because one of the benefits that we have as a company, we've been able to travel across the country collecting data and sitting down with people and sitting in rooms just like this and hearing testimony and making contacts and connections with people who have data. However, it's not allowed to be published throughout the normal channels. Um, so, I mean, we'd like to see at, at the very least a clinical observation Whereas the patients who are here now, who are right now taking medication from various sources, <laughs> um, be observed. Um, we do know that the, the composite board now has uh, submitted, I think it's going to be a quarterly uh, questionnaire that the doctors are supposed to give to the patients. Um, we saw the, the last draft. We haven't seen the final draft. But from what we've seen, it, it, it's it's a <laughs> it's undeserving. Thank you. Uh, Representative Billy Mitchell. Mr. Prosper, you mentioned you made, made attempts to collect data. Uh, what has been the result of your attempts to do so? Oh, it, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> we can't get the, the right permission um, to collect the data as a way to help you with that. Well, let's, from the state level, we've, we've contacted all the agencies that I named. Uh, state Board of Regents, Georgia Medical Composite Board, 
Um, what was it? NIH, DEA at the state level. Because when you call the DEA, the, the federal number, they'll say, oh, you've got to deal with the DEA in your state. Yeah. We've been bounced around. I, <laughs> I, I wish I had the recording with me. Literally, we called for two weeks. We left one message, and only because after leaving that one message for the entire remainder of the two weeks, the lady's recording said, do not leave a message, and it just <laughs> hung up. The doctor, the doctor that what, we worked with, what, what agency was this? DEA. <laughs> Our clinical investigator was so limited, he was ready to file a report, a, a, a report of grievance against the DEA. Now, when you bring it down to the state level, again, we've been bounced around in, in trying to just assist with the, the trials that are going on now. What we're finding out is when we sit down with people, with, with politicians, with the state board of regents, the people that are in charge, they have no idea what's going on, who's in charge, what the process is. And the best answer we get is, hold on, I'll get back to you on that. Let me call around. I mean, we have a call scheduled on Thursday with, with, <laughs> with Mr. Robinson, who had to reschedule that call because, quite frankly, he's not sure of what's happening and who's in charge of what and what trial is currently taking place. He was under the impression that all of the people that are on the list are a part of some clinical trial, and that's absolutely false. Right now, there's only about 14 or 15 people involved in the trial, and they're taking one specific medicine, and that same company is doing the, the clinical trial. You know, you know Mr. Uh, Prosper, if you would get with the, the chairs, um, we can make a demand for that information, and, and they, they're obligated to get back to us. That, that would be awesome, mm -hmm. because, again, it, even the people that we have now are taking it, we don't have a collective of how many of these people have uh, cancer versus uh, epilepsy. We, we don't know. We don't know who's taking what medicine from where. Because we can't cultivate it here and it's not grown here, we have people taking all different variations of medicine, different dosage. Uh, dif they're administering it in different ways. You have different genders, different weights, different ethnic backgrounds. None of this information is being collected so that doctors can make a sound decision and say, this is the dosage. <laughs> Even scaling back to the standardization of the safety of it. We don't know where this medicine is coming from, where it's grown, at what level, how much poison is in it, if there's any uh, mold in it. I mean, there, there's, there's really none. And there's the one ISO certified lab that's certified to deal with cannabis, which you know, we, we brought to the table and we've introduced to members of you know, the committee. It, there's still that process is still slow. Um, so while I, I do recognize that Georgia has, has done a tremendous job in advancing the cause as, far, as fast as I've seen any state move in this country, uh, there's still a lot. There's still a misconception of what step one is, of what the cart is versus what the horse is, and I'm 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 not clear on who's sitting down to figure this out from beginning to end, and if and if. There was a complete bill, and it's been pared down. But now we need to go back and say, okay, of what we have, how much of this is effective? Because, yes, now we have people with cars, and they can get oil from somewhere, wherever. But who is studying this? What are we going to do with this period between now and whenever we go back to review? This, this is critical. This is crucial. We need to know what's happening. What are the effects? And, and just in our networking and being able to sit down with some of these families, we're noticing that you know a lot of kids are getting healthy, depending on where they're getting oil from. We also do know that there are people who who did have an ab effect, not you know not ab to the point where they are worse off than they were before. But we need to know what's in the oil that they're getting and what they're getting. Thank you, Representative Randall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so Mr. Prosper, so your recommendation for our phase two bill is, one, uh, we need to have some type of clinical observation component. Correct. Third, third party. Yes. <coughs> okay. The process and should be a normal process. Anybody should be able to apply, or any uh, medical professional or, or uh, chief investigator should be able to apply and receive the ability to, to host a clinical observation at the very least. Okay, all right, got that. And two, um, that, that we have to create some type of mechanism for data collection to be 
for our state and those those citizens in our state that are using this product in one form or the other. Correct. Okay. What else can we add to our phase two at, at, on your recommendation? Um, um, like one of the participants said earlier, I mean, there's, there's over 50, 60 years of data. There needs to be a department somewhere that's allowed to aggregate this data, put it together, and make sense of it. I mean, it's in all different formats. You have bar graphs, charts, you have 80-page reports. I mean, I just don't understand why we can't treat this like we would treat any other uh, medicine being introduced. Okay. You know, I, don't, I don't recall sitting in front of a committee when oxycodone got now, now, let me ask you this. Now, let, let me ask you this. Now, now you know what we're what we're working on is what we can do on our level within our jurisdiction, yes, state of Georgia, not big, right. just state of Georgia. Right. So let's just stay right here. Okay, not, not a problem. Any more recommendations that we can add to our phase two bill? Or recommendations? <laughs> Lots of them. I mean, we're, we're, that's we're, all we need. Okay, we just I guess. We're here with regards to just the, the, the data, really. Okay. To be honest, the standardization, we're, we're all about safety and efficacy. But so, in order to, to understand that, we need to be able to, to collect the data. Okay. It needs so, to be third party. Right. So once, we, once we're once we done, then you're going to come up and we'll talk to you. We'll talk to you about some of the phases. Uh, Representative uh, Billy Mitchell. Yeah. Mr. Chair, my, my question actually was asked and answered. However, I just would like to add that in the interim, as you know, the, the, the legislative process being a sorted one, uh, in the interim, the information which he has sought and has not been able to get, I think that we should uh, demand that of the agencies. Uh, Absolutely. Um, one, more, one more thing. Um, in HB1, uh, it has on line 9, it talks about outside agencies coming in and being able to help out. Mm -hmm. We really just want to know if it's just one agency or is it a multiple agency that can come in and utilize the resources and, uh, and, and collect data. And we that process it. probably needs to be too. Yeah, and we, I mean, we've gone through the chat. One, it's not even clear. If you call one department on a Tuesday, you're going to get one answer. If you call on a Friday, well, you're not going to get anybody on a Friday. You call on a Thursday, <laughs> that, but it's the truth. If you call on a Thursday, you're going to get a whole other answer. And all we want to know is what do we have to do to be able to bring our team of, of medical professionals or, or scientists or statisticians to be able to collect the data that it's already happening. People are already taking the medicine. We just want to observe them, collect the information, as much information as possible, not just 10 questions about, you know, in, in a period. I think the enough. problem, so I think the problem is that, that nobody knows who's, who's collecting it and where yes. it's being collected, where it's being housed. That's so that, exactly. so, so we need to create a mechanism. That's exactly what A happens. whole, a process but what happens though is when you have people who, are, who this is their life's work and they've taken the time and they spent the, you know, the legal fees to go through and figure out who should be in charge mm -hmm. and you go through the courses and you sit down and you sit, you know, finally get a meeting with these people and for them to just brush you off and say, oh, I'll get back to you, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not adequate. Mm -hmm. You know, and, but we've done the research. We know that several different agencies could give the approval for an outside company or, or a company right here in Georgia or a doctor right here in Georgia to be able to collect that information. So as, so as far as House Bill 1 is concerned, um, it mentions access, but it's but phase 2 needs to include a process for access. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Anything else from you all? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Russell uh, Wiggins. Russell Wiggins. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wiggins, please tell uh, us who you are. Yes. Who you represent. Uh, good morning, everyone. I said thank you for your opportunity. I know your time's important. Uh, and I don't want to be just a few minutes of your time. Uh, my name is Russell Wiggins. I'm one of the original employees of the first medical marijuana lab in the state of California called Steve Peel Laboratories. Uh, and to answer a lot of your questions uh, that you already had, you said, hey, what can we do here to help you guys assist you uh, down the line as far as helping with the state of Georgia? And for me personally, like I said, my background is in the first cannabis lab. I've been in almost every dispensary in the state of California, over 600 dispensaries. And what you guys are missing is you guys want to regulate everything, but 
but you got to forget about the farmer and the user. And if the farmer, like I said, go back to everybody. Everybody can cook chicken, right? But you don't cook everybody's chicken. You don't eat everybody's chicken. So therefore, I think all medicine should be tested. Mm -hmm. And if we have said we have had the data. We've been doing this since 20, since 2010. I met Mr. Brumfield at a cannabis convention. My speaking at he and I were the only minorities there. So to your data to be gone, there are no minorities in this business because it was only me in the state of California. And if it wasn't for me and Steve Hill Laboratories and the founders of Addison Moore and Dave uh, helping me and assisting walking me in there. I had the, the, the data as far as uh, what we do as far as the flowering. Because what you want to do, you want to know is how it's grown, how it's tested, what's in it, what's the harmful dangers of it. So that's what we did. We broke it down. We, we broke it down to not only just doing something, we do potency testing, we do real time polymer testing, pesticide testing, as well as herbicide, fungicide, as well as soil chemical. And then we do nitrogen packaging. Because as a medicine, you want to grow it, be able to grow it healthily, and also store it for your patients. And none of you guys have talked about any of that as far as getting. Wait, do you have a car? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, for not as far as this, no. We'll finish it. Because what I'm saying is because we, will, we provide a certificate of analysis, and that's exactly what you guys ask for when it comes for the patients and it comes for the doctors, and also when it comes from, when it's coming from the actual farmers. Because you want to know what the farmers are doing, what chemicals they're using what pesticides and harmful things. And to be honest with you, it... Mr. Williams, I, I appreciate that, and we knew that. That's why it was a part of the original bill. However, mm -hmm. where we are today, what can you give us? Mm -hmm. What can you give us? Because all that you're saying, we know that. That's the reason why we include it from cultivation to user in our original bill. But we're not there yet. We're not growing. All, all we have is that you can possess it and use it if you can get it here. Correct. But Without getting locked up in the process. Right. But if you possess it and use it, we don't know what it is. What's the I, We know that. But we didn't pass anything that that uh, that overreaching that to, to that that from cultivation to user. Mm -hmm. So where from what we have right now, what can you recommend to us? What what I can recommend to you right now? On a perfect day, uh, you know, we're we're cultivating it and then we've gotten somebody, you know, regulating the, the, the facilities that's growing and regulating how it's growing and all that stuff. But that, we don't have, we're not there yet. Right, because right now all the wheat, uh, all the, the medicine that's been imported, yes. most of that has been tested. And you want to make sure until you guys get it regulated here, like you said, you can grow it in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Just you know, you said, get rid of it in Georgia to your patients and still get it tested. If it's coming in, you should have it tested. Once you're to the point to where you're cultivating it here, you should build a lab locally here. Oh, I know. That's that. That's yeah. on. A, that's what we get to. But what you said earlier is that you guys don't have data to know what you're growing, to what the side effects, to know what it does. Um, we have that. I've been building data since 2009. I know, but that does not apply to us here because we're not growing any here. Right, but for some for educational purposes, you want to know how do we start that? How do we go about that? So when we when we're ready to start that in Georgia, mm -hmm. you want to have that data, you want to have that historical <coughs> knowledge to say, all right, when we first do this, we want a successful run from day one, right? And not just a <laughs> trial and error okay. until you figure this out. So your recommendation to this committee is that we go back and try to include cultivation in, in Georgia? Yes, you should go. One, there'll be two or three things. One, it'll create jobs. And two, it'll create more, more sort of like you do in California. You know where your, where your food is coming from and you know where your food is going. So therefore, if any harmful bacteria, molds, or pesticides right. in, you can backtrack. I agree. If, uh, unless you grow your own food, you don't know what's in it. Right, but if you grow your own food, you, need, you do need to be a standard regulation. You need to be a process that you need to follow, just like a recipe. Right. It needs to come out the exact way every time. We will if keep that in mind. If you're here, if you're there. But like I said, we've been doing this since 2010. We have the data to know if you want a particular flower. You want to know the history of that flower, what it does, the diagnosis. What's the downside to it? We also have that data. We've been building it because if you have to build it to get it, and so, if you don't have it, you've got so to build it. So, your first. primary reason for being here today is that when we get to a point in this state where we're cultivating our own cannabis plant, correct, and even before to let you know so you can tell us how the right way to go about it, right? Because it, it has right. to be either indoor because you can't do it the well. Right. Thanks, Mr. Wiggins. We've been in, in the spirit of time. Do you have something else that you want to add to your testimony? And then after you, we will have uh, Gregory. I think it's the, it's the right reverend, Gregory Diggs. Yeah, I've seen the results as far as, like I said, the test as far as knowing, even with Mr. Brumfield, 
his results were tested his products for years, and I also was a user and he's really advocated that motion. So Thank that'll you. be working. Thank we you. Appreciate your testimony. Did you get some? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Hello. Hi, greetings. I've been blessed to be the Mr. Right Reverend Gregory Carl Davis. And you pulled out a gun for a minute, people jumped before, I have to admit, and uh, I want to appreciate uh, Madam Chairwoman uh, D. Dawkins Hagler, appreciate you, and the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus Minority Committee on Medical Cannabis for providing this forum and for giving me the honor of addressing you all. <laughs> This healing ministry is ordained with the blessings of the true patriarch of Una Mercorios of the Ethiopian Orthodox White Oak Church through the Order of Heindel, uh, the Holy Cross of Reverend Father Elmer W. Heindel, honored at Fort Banning, and then later recognized as Corporation Soul, Georgia Statute of 1758, and international, federal, state, canon, and tort law, and by the Federal Reserve Bank, the Georgia Composite Medical Board and the Georgia Secretary of State as Mr. Wright Reverend Gregory Carl Davis, Doctor of Cannabosum. Okay, this recent Sunday, St. Luke the Physician Day, in celebration for the Anglican Communion calendar, this doctrine was read from the pulpit at St. Luke's Episcopal Church, 435 Peachtree Street, Atlanta, Georgia, in Ecclesiasticus. The Lord has created medicines out of the earth and he that is wise will not abhor them. This ministry began working with researcher Richard Brumfield on the day of Pentecost, May 23, 2010, at Saint All Saints Parish in the Atlanta Episcopal Diocese when Bishop J. Neal Alexander received this revelatory cannabis healing ministry and blessing said, Go slay the giant. Later, a Mexican clinic for a physician monitored patient response trial was arranged for Richard Brumfield Elixir and the positive findings were reported to the Georgia Composite Medical Board. In letter dated July 20, 2011, Governor Nathan Deal encouraged this ministry to work with the Georgia Composite Medical Board to establish the Patient Qualification Review Board. Previous, this ministry lobbied the Georgia Composite Medical Board to write the regulations for this updated law, 2010, and then later to publish the notice that the Patient Qualification Review Board recruitment is underway on their website. During the 2013-14 legislative session and later during the Senate House Joint Committee on Medical Cannabis, this ministry lobbied that Georgia law provides for the distribution of medical cannabis through the Certified Pharmacy and Secretary of State Regulation as a Schedule II drug. And the FDA, in letter dated June 1st, 2010, approved this drug, naturally derived dronabinol, for marketing as a Schedule III. Director Rick Allen for the Georgia Drugs and Narcotics Agency informed the Senate House Joint Committee on Prescription for Medical Cannabis that the problem is this drug... THC was taken out of the American Pharmacopoeia in 1942, and no DEA agents will speak on the record. Senior Assistant Attorney General Janet Ray advises both the Georgia Pharmacy Board and the Georgia Composite Medical Board, and has been monitoring the issue of medical marijuana since 2010. That year, the Iowa Board of Pharmacy was given a national award for taking sworn testimony in public hearings with medical evidence submitted that determined that yes, cannabis is medicine. The Iowa Board of Pharmacy sent a recommendation to the Iowa legislature to reschedule. The Supreme Court of Canada, the several states, and the executive governor of Puerto Rico are all in agreement. This drug is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Public Health. California Department of Public Health and appellate court term this drug cannabis concentrate. 
Our emerging work as registered health care provider and doctor of cannabosum is to establish a statewide caretaker recruitment and training program for the Department of Public Health low THC registry utilizing a compliant medical food and more. The lic these licensed caretakers are limited by federal regulation to provide for and monitor no more than five active patients. The role of the caretaker is to provide cannabis-based research medicine to their patients and document their interaction with attending physician for chart monitoring purposes, Department of Public Health statistical analysis. Uh, Mr. Frank Reverend uh, Gregory. I got I got I got I got, a, got, I, got a, I got you, but 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 here, here's the thing, you're constrained by time. How much how much longer do you have? I'm I'm getting into the heart now where the way okay, so, 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 but yeah, in the spirit of, of giving everyone the opportunity to testify, if you could give us in you know, another thirty seconds or so, what are your recommendations for this committee? And then and if we can give you an opportunity to speak after we get everyone's testimony out to finish your testimony, that would be great. But give us one or two things that you can glean from what you're reading that we can take well, and utilize in this next session. Well, this, the Georgia Commission on Medical Cannabis in the hearing September 30th uh, received testimony from the Oregon contingent that a compounded formula of naturally derived renabinol containing a ratio of 5 points THC and 1 part cannabinoids followed by with cannabidiol and terpenes are an effective treatment for cancers. They took that testimony ischemic conditions, and pain management. This ministry's findings are the 50-50 ratio of cannabis extracts, and we go on a little bit here. But the political liability is what we're talking about. It's the term that has emerged to describe the inertia of bringing forward this treatment in conflict with United Nations treaty obligations and international pharmaceutical licensing agreements. The Controlled Substance Therapy Research Act is an FDA-compliant research program, and so is the low THC oil registry. The state of Israel operates a compliant program. A Georgia-sponsored reproduction, administration, and distribution of cannabis research medicine can be accomplished through the Cancer Control Center. That is expanded to include the authority of the certified pharmacy and broadly defined as treating endocannabinoid deficiency supplemented by phytocannabinoid, a medical food. This research program will establish worldwide standards for label of phytocannabinoid therapy. Production and distribution costs will be subsidized by grant and foundation resources, charitable organizations, that is licensed in Georgia already. These cancer control and other medical condition centers would be inspected and certified by the Department of Agriculture. Representative Roger Bruce. Okay. Do you have any recommendations? Give us the, the recommendations because we have other people out here, so we're trying to understand it. Not being critical, but I don't think any of us knew what the heck you just said. I'm right? sorry. I, I, but but let's 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 get to what the recommendations are. The recommendations are simple. This, this, this drug, naturally derived dronabinol, which we've all been talking about, is an FDA-approved drug. It's not DEA-moved. It's not going to get moved. We can distribute it in Georgia through a research program that's limited to the state, which is both the Controlled Substance Therapeutic Research Act and the low THC oil registry. Those are, those are approved programs. Our problem is we can't get the drug into the system, so to speak. We do have a mechanism in the certified pharmacy within the Controlled Substance Therapeutic Research Act. If that authority of the certified pharmacy was placed within the Department of Public Health, the Department of Public Health owns this drug. It's a people's medicine, not a pharmaceutical. The, the jurisdiction of this drug under the with it placed within the Department of Public Health for their distribution and then they distribute it and research to see how the patient responds. And that's what we have in these two programs. How do they respond? And they respond and then we label the medicine. Here you have to take this much THC, this much CB. That's, that's the, the purpose of a statewide program is patient monitoring and, um, and labeling. And this could be done for a 
of all medical conditions. So, so your recommendation would be, if, if I hear you correctly, your recommendation would be to take the certified pharmacy and potentially the cancer uh, control center and place those under the auspices of uh, the Department of Public Health. The, the, the can, you know, is that what you're saying? It, I, I'm saying that to, to elaborate is that the Cancer Control Center is already a program in the Department of Public Health. And now the certified pharmacy, how do they tie in? The, the certified pharmacy is a research program from the 80s that has that went into funk and we tried to revive and the and inertia and all. And so, but it has within it that what's called the certified pharmacy. That's the authority to receive these cannabinoids that's in Georgia call code now. Okay. It's in the law. That we could, that the certified, but the okay, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. We've got it. Uh, anything else with good measure? Do you have any other? Okay, I appreciate your time. And we appreciate your testimony. Like to yes, indeed. Thanks. Uh, is it Lori Howard? Yes, yes. Uh, hi, Lori. Hi, thank you so much for this here and I am coming at it from a totally different perspective sort of from the perspective of the guy that was right before me and that is from the cultivation uh, point of it. I think it's, it's very important that we take a very close look at uh, this, this product being uh, cultivated here in Georgia. Um, I just want to read something to you really, really, really quickly. It's not a book but this came from um, a group called the uh, RP group uh, but, but it says, according to the latest report by Marijuana Investment and Research Firm, the Art View Group, legal commerce of the substance in the United States brought in $2.5 billion in 2014. That number is expected to exceed $10 billion over the next five years as the demand increases and the new market opens up. As additional states move forward legalizing, uh, move, forward, legal, move forward legalization, there is a push for African Americans to grab a seat at the table in this lucrative, this lucrative trade. Uh, so basically, what, what is happening here, uh, what I term as the, um, the green gold mine, because this is, this, this is an opportunity not just for African Americans, but everyone to, that can produce this to generate generational wealth, which is something uh, African Americans have not had an opportunity to do. Um, there is an article uh, that I would like for you all just to write it down. I'm, I'm wrapping this up. Um, but the, the article, just type in uh, Marley Natural, the weed that manages to sell out both Marley and the Jamaicans. Very interesting article. Is it Marley, M-A-R-L-E-Y? M-A-R-L-E-Y, yes. Please look that up. So um, I, I know the, the medical part of it is very, very important. That's number one. But we've got to look at the cultivation of it. We've got to be able to do, to do the cultivation here and bring that wealth in Georgia and not just have one company doing that. Uh, because if, if you can produce it, if once you guys come up with the regulations and the guidelines and Q and A, uh, then whoever is able to put that in place with their cultivation, they should have a seat at that table. Mm -hmm. So I want it to be looked at from the cultivation standpoint and uh, generated generating uh, wealth for uh, generations to come. Thank you, Representative Robert, Roger Bruce. Then I think you kind of, wait a before you go, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, the whole conversation is around who's going to make money off of exactly. the legalization yes, of this stuff. That's it. And, and um, you know, but as a, another concern, you know, as to who's going to make money off of it, I, you know, I know that somebody, the doctor, wherever she, she's left, but mm -hmm. she said nobody's died from it. And, and, and I understand that. But that doesn't mean that if we don't, do this the correct way that nobody won't die from right, it. Right, exactly. And, um, you know, so my concern is to make sure that we look at all of the, the pieces of it because we're still talking about taking something, some substance, whatever we want to call it, putting it in somebody's body with the intent for whatever that is to, to cause some change in how their body functions. And I want to make sure that before we get out totally in front of this thing, and we know what we're getting out in front of, and that 
like I said, because we haven't killed anyone doesn't mean we won't if we don't do this correctly. So you kind of hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned. You know, but you got to separate all of these things. Oh, yeah. They're not all one thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so. and, and there is something that I want to, to say with uh, Dr. Uma. Um, when you read the article, um, there's a lot of here. The cannabis was introduced to Jamaica in the, 20, in the 19th century by colony immigrant laborers from India. Representative Dawkins. That was inappropriate that she was here yeah. today. She's yeah. from Representative Dawkins. I do have a question for you. Do you do you have your um, what you just read? Is that the Marley report? Yes. Just Google it. Just Google it, and it'll pull it right up. Yes. What is your background? Um, I'm a civil servant by uh, profession. I've been in local government all my life. I have an MBA, MPA. I'm from Mercer in Georgia College and State University, and I'm currently employed with Augusta Richmond County. And so I drove up here today, and this is actually my third time coming up here. I've sat in on some of uh, Pete's um, committees, and, and, and some of the things that went on in that committee really concerned me. And I reached out to some additional people, and that's how I actually found out about what, what was this group today. So I'm so happy to see that um, there are more people <laughs> that look like me that are actually in, interested in something that really can be huge for, for this country and as well as our people and uh, other indigenous. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, just a, a point of personal privilege, Lori, uh, I've known her, I had no idea you are going to be here. I've known her for years. She's a, uh, she was a very instrumental person in making Georgia, which is where I represent, and did a fantastic job in the capacity that you had there. So thank you for being here. Uh, to that end, there's going to be, just by way of just giving you guys a background of what's going to happen next year, there's probably going to be some activity around cultivation and production. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be a limited amount of licenses that we're hearing that are going to go out. Part of the diligence that this group has to have, including, I mean, I consider us all a part of this group, is who are those licenses go to? And then what is the impact in the communities in which those people have the ability to cultivate and produce? Is there any community benefits agreement that we can tie into? Because the community should be benefiting from the revenue that's generated. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure because I came in just a tad bit late if there is a, a thought out there around uh, legalization because there are a lot of people who look like me uh, who are in jail. Mm -hmm. Who? What do you do with those sentences? If you're going to legalize it in one respect, mm -hmm. should the people who are doing this who may not have the resources to produce and distribute it in a massive scale, what do we do about the incarceration of those folks? Mm -hmm. and, so, and so please, as you guys are pondering over all the efficacies and the issues that go along with uh, medical marijuana, let's think about who gets production and distribution licenses, how do those benefit a community, and then what is the legal imp implication that happens with people who have gone into the system as a result of using this medication. Okay, uh, now, next person I'm going to get in here is Dr. I think Dr. Kat, Kathy. She, she was jumping up, wasn't she? I think she already had her chance. Okay, uh, Carlos Frazier. Is Carlos Frazier in, in the building? Yes. Okay. Carlos Frazier. Okay. Introduce yourself and uh, tell us why you're here, what organization you're with. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Carlos Frazier. I represent the IV Group uh, for a software development company. I'm a disabled veteran. Been disabled since 1993. Uh, what actually got me to the industry was the medication I was on. I started damaging my liver and my kidneys at the age of 22. Um, so what I did was start, start to research alternative medicines that could help with my chronic pain. I have three herniated, herniated discs in my lower back and two on my neck. Um, throughout the research, I figured uh, cannabis was the best alternative for me. It actually uh, helped with the pain and helped me able to function, uh, back to function as a, as a person, as a, as a citizen. What my company does is we develop a software that helps uh, with compliance uh, for the dispensaries as well as the growers. We've also developed another software that helps with the uh, inspectors. Um, what the gentleman was saying earlier, 
so you'll know exactly what's being used in the grow process. We'll be able to go into the growers as well as dispensaries and tell you how long something can sit on the shelf. Um, if, if it's the proper labeling, things of that nature. So what we're doing with this industry is coming in and bringing out a structure and organiz uh, organization uh, that can help everyone uh, be more at ease with what they're doing. Some, someone like the FDA, uh, and that doesn't exist in this industry at all. So we'll be able to come through, uh, like the state of Georgia, and be able to help with the, uh, the, the growers and let you know what they're using, what they're growing, if they're picking uh, proper times, if the product is mobile, things of that nature. We'll also be able to go into the, uh, the dispensaries and let you know the shelf life of, of certain products, of tinctures and, and edibles. We'll also be able to let you know, uh, we'll give our certificates, let you know if this is a, uh, a reputable grower or a reputable dispensary. Uh, if not, then we'll also post that as well, too. Um, but like I said, our software is coming in to help bring organization and structure to this. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the committee? All right. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, and he was. Not told you. Lastly, is, Anto is Antonia Green here?
Well, Mr. Green, we appreciate your, your testimony. Um, and the thought process for Madam Chair was, if you look at the, the hearings of the board that are still listening to testimony, uh, we felt it was a shame and a sham, quite frankly, that the minority community in Georgia wasn't being represented on that board. And through the leadership of Madam Chair, we wanted to listen to testimony today from our, from our community, our constituents, because we are your advocates here. And I'm a practicing eye doctor. My homeless is not even on the, the formula because they wrote it all. Now, glaucoma disproportionately affects African Americans. Mm -hmm. So, and I treat glaucoma. Mm -hmm. I was trained to do that. But the reality is, is that we're all suffering from the same thing, and I agree with you completely. And that is, and I'm taking a point of personal privilege again, there's a crisis of consciousness in this country that won't include everybody in the conversation. Absolutely. And that's what we're trying to do here today. So we appreciate what you just said. And we're going to do something about it. And we have some sticks and some carrots to offer them next year. But I agree with you wholeheartedly. I agree with Dr. Uma. Is that if you're trained to prescribe this stuff, prescribe it. And or we'll recommend it. Whatever language you want to use for today. But we're going to do something about it. So we appreciate your testimony. And uh, we look forward to hearing you at, a, at another meeting. Sorry, I wasn't able to get my name on the list, but I was hoping I could still take a few moments every time. You have 35 okay. seconds. No, go ahead. Yeah, tell us who you are. No, no. Tell my us who you are. My name is I'm a Georgia State resident. I was born and raised in Macon, Georgia. Been here for uh, 34 years outside of my time when I was in the Marine Corps. I am a disabled veteran. Um, this is my PTSD TBI dog. His name is Ruger. He's been on his best behavior today. I'm thankful for that. Um, I'd like to say that there's a couple of quick things to help you. Like you said, you wanted you know, just ammo, just something to be able to, to hold and grasp your hand on. And one of the big things I think we missed at this committee meeting that we had at the, I guess, well, with the other committee meeting with Alan Peake was Dr. Whitmore, Dr. Morris, and Dr. Parks. Uh, we had Dr. Morris who runs the single largest uh, intestinal um, IG practice in the state of Georgia. I know of, I think it's the largest practice in the southeast. Uh, Dr. Whitmore is, uh, not only has she sat over Harvard, Princeton, Emory, and Grady as a pharmacological uh, um, trial doctor. She's considered one of the nation's best trial doctors and there is in research doctors for trial. And she wants to take this to research. We're talking the best and the brightest in the business that are here in Atlanta are willing to take this and have already done it. Number two, she brought up an amazing thing that hasn't been brought up today. Um, as it pertains, we have several doctors in the room, at least we did at one point in time. Um, how many FDA approved medicines are there for uh, epilepsy, for DeBay syndrome? How many approved, how many FDA approved medicines are there for uh, pediatric cancer, cancer patients? That's right, there's none. There are zero FDA approved medicines to treat epilepsy in pediatric patients, yet we hand out the medicine, guessing and checking our prescriptions from these doctors. Yet they want to tell us that a medicine that doesn't kill anybody can't be prescribed. Every 19 minutes, we've been in this room for about two and a half hours, and every 19 minutes somebody dies from pharmaceutical drugs. Whether they were prescribed or abused, it doesn't matter. They left the counter and they got in the hands of somebody and it killed them. That means that since we've been sitting here, eight people have died. All of that to tell you one very, very important thing to me. I think there's a minority group that's been completely left out of this uh, paradigm, and that's the veterans. Veterans like myself with PTSD and TBI were not being represented by the original bill. We were thrown under the rug. And the media likes to act like we're not being thrown under the rug. The VA likes to act like they care, but the VA won't even prescribe me medicine anymore. Nine months ago, I was told I was going to die from a gastroenterological issue that nobody could tell me what it was. And after I did everything, 37 pharmaceutical medicines came off my shelf and was supplemented with one substance that I had to fly out to Seattle where I had a friend who lived in order to have access to it. Five months ago, after having lost 70 pounds from an IG issue that nobody could tell me what was happening, I had been to the hospital one time. It cost the American people $350 plus thousand dollars to hospitalize me when something one medicine cured. Right. You paid that. Right. These people paid that, right. and it was completely unnecessary to pay that. That's right. And we've been forgotten. 
and that is completely unacceptable. So as far as I'm concerned, recommendations that I could give anybody in authority and in the power of the state is to tell the federal government to kiss your backside. Just like Kim Davis told them in Kentucky. I'd rather be in jail, smoking a joint, being alive and being healthy. I would love to see the state of Georgia take me away from my dog, my family, my children, and my medicine because it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. Or you can continue to pursue and tell your uh, local police chiefs and your sheriffs to start the process of decriminalization when there's possession for nonviolent crimes. Houston County, Georgia, the Warner Robins uh, City Police Department arrested 99 people in six months for possession of marijuana. Only nine, 90 of those people, 90 of those people had less than an ounce of marijuana and were pulled over for a stupid traffic violation. No reason to put them in jail. Now they'll tell you, oh, they broke the law. Well, at the same amount of time, nine citations were written for the exact same thing where somebody didn't go to jail. All they did was go to court, paid a fine, and went home. Mm -hmm. So how is it fair to those 90%? By the way, the nine people that got cited, all white. <laughs> hey, man, brother. Uh, brother uh, so, <laughs> Representative Billy Mitchell. Yeah, you know, Mr. Chair, I just, we just suggest that we get his, his name on the list. My name is David Ballinger. And uh, there's some information so that uh, we can utilize the testimony, if not yourself, in the future. This is what I do now. I was a federal employee when I left the military um, in the Marine Corps in 2009. I immediately went to work at Robbins Air Force Base, a civil service employee for the Defense Logistics Agency, where I was a specialist in transportation hazardous material. I was the guy that signed off the paperwork to send a new across the country. I'm the guy that signed off the paperwork to put gas or anything that needed to be done across the country. And because of the lifestyle that I have to live now, I put my security clearance, my job, my livelihood, and my freedom at risk. I had an $80,000 a year job. In order for me to stay medicated and do what I want to do, I risk persecution, and I'm a server at a restaurant now, barely making ends meet. I appreciate the state of Georgia. I appreciate the federal government. You screwed me, and nobody cares, except for you. You're here, and you're listening to me. So me, don't forget this minority, because we come in every shape, every color, every disease. We represent everywhere and everything. If you can get us on your board, if you can get us in your trials, if you can get us there, there's no longer any more room for any more questions because we encompass every single last research opportunity that you could. And we're all, most of us are all going to be labeled. You know, we all, we, we all have the ability of all these different diseases, pains, chronic illnesses, you know, the top three issues that you have with veterans are neurological, IG, chronic pain. Wow, go figure. That's the top three reasons why you prescribe cannabidiols and THC. Let's save a life. Let's save a veteran's life. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Before we leave, uh, uh, Representative Mayor. First of all, thank you for your service. Uh, yes. We truly appreciate it. Yes. Thank you for your service. Make this country safe and, and, and we allow to, to have the freedom that we have. Um, uh, great testimony. Uh, I just want to leave with, with one thought. Um, uh, I've, I have asthma, I have COPD, uh, uh, I have chronic pain, I take tramadol, gabapentin, or you, 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 you name it. Uh, my wife has chronic rheumatoidal arthritis, so she also takes a, a bunch of, of medicines. But the point that when the committee didn't have representation of minorities, uh, when they were going around the, the, the state, uh, it's it's all on us. Uh, and I, I, maybe this is this is a, away from the topic of today. But as you know, blacks and Latinos have, uh, have don't go to the polls. They don't register to vote. So again, I just wanna I just wanna make sure that you know if you really truly want representation that really caters to you and the people that looks like you speak like you we need to make sure that you know that we enforce that in our communities uh, because if we are not in the table what's going to happen other people are going to decide for us so so again I just I just want to leave with that because again it was shameful that that we have we were not at the you table. You can help us. You can help us by doing this, okay? Because we have activists. Me, I'll go to jail. I don't care. You want to put me in jail? You put me in jail for what I believe. But we have so many people out there that want to be activists that can't because of the fear mm -hmm. of death True. and persecution and prosecution. So the way you can help us by doing that 
I'm sorry. The way you can help us by doing that is help decriminalize in whatever area you're in so that activists like me can stand up and speak and not fear jail. Because I guarantee you that you're not going to find a whole lot of other veterans that are willing to throw an 80% disability check mm -hmm. that they get every the first of every month, like I am, throwing it away if I go to jail for a felony. But if that's what I have to do to prevent the three veterans that killed themselves while we've been standing here, plus the eight pharmaceutical deaths since we've been standing here, I'll do it every day and three times on Sunday. We appreciate your testimony. Yeah, October, November, November 10th.